The Nine Lives of Ski Mask, Life 7, Horror. Chapter 1, My Specialty. Tamale Jones sits in his office, reassuring his client on the phone. Don't fret, Mrs. Saunders. I got the best bruiser in the world on the case. Don't worry, your ex-husband don't stand a chance. I'll call you when the deed is done. Tamale hangs up the phone, looks at his Dunhill wristwatch, and contemplates whether or not he has enough time to make it to Juan's Tamale shack and back before Ski Mask returns from putting the screws on Mrs. Saunders' ex-husband. You can do it. He hustles out from behind his desk and hurries to the door. He nearly knocks over the petite Claire, who was just about to enter. Oh, pardon me, lady. Tamale doesn't even look at Claire as he fumbles for his keys and begins locking the door. Uh, hi. Do you know a private detective they call Tamale Jones? You're looking at him. He locks the door and quickly moves down the hallway to the main entrance of the building. Claire does her best to keep up. Can I hire you? I'm afraid my slate is full at the moment, sweetheart. Do you know when you'll be available? No telling. You're better off going elsewhere. He rushes out the door and down the sidewalk, keeping his gaze forward as Claire breaks into a jog to keep pace with him. Well, can you recommend someone? What kind of job are you looking for? I'd like to have someone followed. Anyone can do a simple tail job. I need someone good. Oh, there's a pro skirt named Platinum. She's real good when it comes to tailing. Pro skirt? Tamale stops, lets out a sigh of aggravation, and looks Claire's way for the first time. A whore. He takes out a small slip of paper and starts scribbling on it. She hangs out at a crazy joint called Club Fun. It's over on High Point. Good luck. He hands her the card, looks at his watch again, and darts across the street. Claire gets into her car. She looks down at the address on the card and wonders what kind of a place Club Fun is. When she arrives to the address, she is surprised to see that the building appears to be an abandoned elementary school. She would suspect it was empty if it weren't for the rather full parking lot. Upon closer inspection, she can see a strobe light behind the main entrance door and a dim red light coming from another room. The strobe light she spotted from the parking lot is a lot farther down the corridor than she expected, leaving the foyer dark. She can see the silhouette of a person next to a nearby wall, but cannot make out any details. Claire leans in toward the figure. I'm looking for someone named Platinum? The silhouette lets out a loud, shrieking cackle, steps back and disappears into the shadows. Claire startles, crinkles her brow, and turns down the corridor. Immediately, she encounters a lanky woman in full gothic attire walking toward her. Excuse me, do you know a woman named Platinum? The gothic woman completely ignores Claire and walks past her. Claire turns, watches the gothic woman walk down the hall, and whispers to herself. Rude! The hall gets brighter as Claire continues on. She can see pastel colors zooming down the wall. They probably had a more pleasant effect back when this was a functioning school. In the building's current form, it's unsettlingly out of place. Claire slows as she passes a room and notices movement coming from within. Upon stopping and moving close to the doorway, she can see a man with flowing blonde hair standing in front of a locker. He unbuttons his white dress shirt and removes it, leaving him only wearing black pants and black boots. She is growing uncomfortable with his lack of clothing, but tolerates it, hoping that he can help her find Platinum. Shortly after pulling a black latex outfit out of the locker, the long-haired man notices Claire watching him. A subtle grin comes over his face as he sets the black latex one-piece back in the locker and struts casually toward Claire. When he reaches the doorway, he stops and methodically looks Claire up and down, making Claire extremely uneasy, to the point where she takes a couple steps back. She begins to open her mouth to ask her question when an elegant woman in her 50s wearing a sparkling evening gown steps in front of her and addresses the long-haired man. Hello, long hair. Are you performing tonight? Long hair nods. Marvelous. Absolutely marvelous. 
When the elegant woman turns to walk away, Claire quickly speaks to her. Do you know where I can find a woman named Platinum? The elegant woman steps back and smiles fully as she observes Claire. Look at you. So tiny. So adorable. The elegant woman doesn't address Claire's question. She simply walks away. Claire looks back at Longhair, who continues to grin confidently while he gawks at Claire. Sorry to bother you, but do you know someone here named Platinum? Longhair completely disregards Claire's question, reaches his hand out, and caresses her chin with his thumb. Claire instantly recoils from his advance, which Longhair finds insulting. His grin transforms into a grimace, and he slams the door in her face. Discouraged, yet determined, Claire continues down the corridor until she reaches an adjoining corridor. She stops, contemplating whether to continue forward or turn down the new corridor, when she notices two people standing by a nearby room. One is a woman in her 30s with light blonde frizzy hair. She's wearing a red corset, black skirt, and boots. She eyes Claire in a seductive manner while running her finger around a gold necklace. She is flanked by a short man wearing hospital scrubs, a furry rubber wolf mask, and wolfman gloves. The blonde woman leans closer to the wolfman and speaks discreetly to him, but Claire can make out that she said, Bring her to me. The woman enters the room and closes the door behind her as the wolfman approaches Claire. The mistress has requested your presence in her chambers. Claire looks past the wolfman to the room the mistress entered. In there? The wolfman holds up a finger. Do not keep the mistress waiting. The wolfman turns, enters the room, and shuts the door behind him. Claire stands pondering whether or not to open the door and ask if they know who Platinum is, or just leave. This has turned out to be a lot more trouble and way too weird for her. Before she decides, she hears a cat call whistle behind her, followed by a feminine voice. I wouldn't go in there if I were you. You might never be seen again. Claire turns to see a woman in her 40s, wearing a platinum blonde wig. She is sporting a tight black cotton top, short black skirt, fishnet stockings, and over-the-knee boots. I hear you're looking for me. Are you Platinum? In the flesh. Platinum steps closer to Claire, eyeing her up and down. You are scrumptious. I just want to eat you up. Claire disregards her comment and gets straight to business. I understand you're good at following people and gathering information about them. That's my specialty. Now why would a sweet petite thing like you need someone followed? It's nothing nefarious. I just want to know more about someone. Ah, curiosity. It killed the cat, you know. And who, may I ask, do you need followed? Your husband? Boyfriend? Girlfriend? Platinum smiles seductively. What? No. My boss. Your boss? I'm intrigued. What is it you want to know about your boss? Claire seems unsure and takes a moment to answer the question. I guess where he goes, what he does, that sort of thing. That's easy. What's your boss's name? Ski Mask. Ski Mask. The meter just moved from intrigue to fascination. I need a picture and information as to where I can initially find him. Platinum offers up her email information as Claire takes out her phone and sends her a rare picture of Ski Mask. Along with that, she sends the name of the closest main crossroads to his residence. Thanks for the info, beautiful. I'll expect payment after the job is complete. Of course. Platinum nondiscreetly looks Claire over again. You are positively mouthwatering. Claire, extremely uncomfortable by Platinum's advances, prepares to leave when she notices a man donning a skin-tight black outfit walk by them. He's wearing a matching black mask with a zipper over the mouth. 
Long blonde hair flows out from under the mask, making Claire realize it's the rude man known as Long Hair. As he passes them, he catches the eye of Platinum, who watches his ass wiggle as he struts toward a room. I'm going to catch Long Hair's performance. Would you like to join me? Absolutely not, but thank you. Aw, that makes Platinum sad. Claire searches for a way to end the conversation on a cordial note. Uh, sorry. Platinum grins. You are luscious. She quickly caresses Claire's cheek, but before Claire can back away, Platinum turns and follows in the direction of long hair. Claire lets out a deep breath and whispers to herself. I hope this wasn't a mistake. Chapter 2 Not Your Average Joe When Claire gives her the heads up that Ski Mask would be leaving his residence soon, Platinum positioned her maroon 1978 Buick Electra in a discreet location near the main crossroads Claire had pointed out. Once identifying Ski Mask, tailing him was rather easy. His first stop was to the office of Tamale Jones. While having never met him personally, Platinum is well aware of Tamale's reputation for being an old-style gumshoe detective. She knows that he's the guy to go to for underground services. Apparently, he is aware of her as well. More than one of her past clients mentioned that they heard of her from him. Ski Mask wasn't in his office for long. When she sees him cross the street and begin walking down the sidewalk, she gets out of her car and begins to follow. Her tight pink sweater, short black skirt, and over-the-knee boots makes a clear impression as to what her profession is. Although in reality, Platinum is not a prostitute, it's merely a front. While one might think blending in with the average woman might make her less noticeable, Platinum finds that most people don't give a whore a second glance. And if she's spotted multiple times on a job, the assumption is that she's simply walking the streets turning tricks. She keeps a respectable distance from Ski Mask, following him several blocks before he turns and walks through a well-lit parking lot. He stops by the entrance of a short alley. She knows it well. At the other end is a neighborhood pub called the Tap Room Tavern. It's of moderate size with a small dance floor. It's the kind of a place that during the week has a neighborhood pub feel where one can relax, have a beer, and watch a ball game. But on the weekends it transforms into more of a small nightclub where patrons can let their hair down, dance, and mingle. Platinum's intrigue grows when she witnesses Ski Mask remove a black Ski Mask from his back pocket pull it over his head, and step into the darkness of the alley. Normally she would think him to be the run-of-a-mill mugger, but having seen him come from Tamale Jones' office, she puts it together quickly that he's one of Tamale's thugs. Curious to see him fulfill his assignment, Platinum turns the corner and walks another block to the street that houses the other side of the alley. As she strolls down the street close to the alley entrance, a cool breeze picks up and she pauses under a streetlight to assess the area. The activity associated with the street comes in waves. At times, it's very quiet. The only other person she sees is a huge tattooed bodybuilder type standing outside of the taproom tavern, having difficulty lighting his cigarette. She can see his growing frustration with the task and observes him as he steps into the alley for shelter against the wind. As Platinum slowly moves closer to the alley entrance, she can hear the bodybuilder barking at someone. She carefully sneaks her head into the alley just enough to watch without being noticed, and she immediately sees who the bodybuilder is shouting at. It's Ski Mask. He stands menacingly at the other entrance, and when the two men start racing toward each other, it's Ski Mask, not the larger man, who moves with utter confidence. Platinum is slightly disappointed when the two men meet. She was expecting a somewhat competitive affair, but this is nothing of the sort. Ski Mask toys with the big man and in no time has him in some sort of wrist lock, turning him into a whining baby. 
She can't hear everything Ski Mask is saying, but she chuckles to herself as she gets the gist of it. Something about the big man leaving his ex-wife alone and ordering him to move to Mexico. Platinum holds back a gasp as she witnesses Ski Mask cut one of the bodybuilder's fingers off with a pair of pruners. She watches on as Ski Mask belittles the big man before walking away. The bodybuilder feels around for his lopped off finger. He picks it up and is bawling when he rushes out of the alley past her. Platinum watches on as Ski Mask disappears out of the back alley. She raises her eyebrows and whispers to herself, Wow, this guy is not your average Joe. Chapter 3 The Killer Platinum stands in the shadows as she stakes out the entrance to Tamale Jones' building. Ski Mask entered moments ago, likely to pick up his pay. She expects his night is done. He'll probably head home after this, but she'll complete the job by tailing him until it's official. It appears it will be an easy night. She was mistaken when she thought of Ski Mask as one of Tamale's thugs. This guy is something else altogether. He's a specialist. Clearly this is the man Tamale calls in for his most important and no doubt most expensive assignments. This explains why his identity would remain a mystery to Claire. This isn't the type of employment one would share with just anybody. But who is Claire to him? Is she just anybody? She referred to Ski Mask as her boss. Boss of what? What does she do? These are questions that Platinum never asks of her clients. It's none of her business, and frankly she doesn't care. But something is different when it comes to Claire. That scrumptious little frame, those breathtaking eyes, the way she oozes innocence, and those lips, those soft, kissable lips. She's not just anybody. Platinum's lack of focus as she thinks about Claire causes her to be startled when a small, short-haired dachshund runs by her, scampers out into the middle of the street, and stops. At the same time, Ski Mask exits Tamale's office. Ski Mask immediately takes interest in the dog, calling to him, urging him to get out of the street as a car rushes toward the dog. Platinum watches as the spectacle unfolds and is in shock when she sees Ski Mask dive in front of the car to save the dog from death. The car that struck Ski Mask is partially obstructing her vantage point, but she can see that he is laying still and that the driver, who is now out in the street, is frantic as he looks around. Platinum ducks for cover to ensure not to be seen. When she looks back up, she sees the frantic man. Is he pulling Ski Mask into his car? Her eyes did not deceive her. She stands shocked for a moment as the man drives off, leaving no evidence of what just took place. Platinum hightails it to her Buick and steps on the gas. She was afraid she lost the man, but fortunately, due to his erratic driving, she is able to spot him and begins tailing. It isn't long before the car reaches a desolate part of town full of abandoned two-story houses. The car pulls down a drive, leading to one of said houses. She parks around the corner and observes as the frantic man rushes to the house and returns with an old bald man. Their short conversation results in the frantic man running inside and returning with a gurney, which they promptly place Ski Mask on and push him inside. What the hell? All kinds of thoughts race through Platinum's mind as she continues watching the house. Is Ski Mask dead? What are they doing to him? Cutting him up? Hiding the body? Harvesting the organs? Who are these people? Can I blackmail them? When some activity finally resumes, she wasn't expecting it to be Ski Mask walking out of the house holding the dachshund, both seemingly fine. The surprise of the sight causes Platinum a mental lapse and she stands in plain sight long enough for Ski Mask to spot her. When she realizes this, she quickly gets into her car and drives down the road. What an idiot I am. It's one thing to be spotted. It's another thing to be caught gawking. 
After a few moments, she slowly drives back to the street and can see Ski Mask, who has walked a distance from the house, talking to someone in a car and then opening the door and getting in. She tails the car for a short while and then they pull over next to a nondescript business. The man driving the car, who happens to be tuxedo clad, hurries into the building leaving Ski Mask behind. It's not long before Ski Mask exits the car and enters the building, leaving Platinum perplexed. Normally Platinum wouldn't even consider getting out and taking a closer look at the building. She'd merely wait for the person she is tailing to return and continue to follow from there. But this has been an unusual night and her curiosity is getting the better of her. Platinum exits her Buick and casually strolls up the street next to the building. She nonchalantly peers into the lobby to see what they are doing and stops when she notices that the lobby is void of any people. Shit, did I lose him? She moves closer to the glass entrance, shields the glare with her cupped hands and looks in. She's slightly taken aback by the unusual castle-like wooden door with the words In Eternum written next to it, and jumps when Ski Mask steps out of the lobby bathroom, still holding the dog. He is looking directly at her. <sighs> Shit! She can see Ski Mask lunge forward toward her and she immediately turns and runs. Platinum is not much of a runner to begin with, but her clunky boots slow her top speed even more. She knows she's done for, there's no way she can outrun him. As she runs, she starts thinking of excuses as to what she can tell him when he catches her. She'll try to just brush it off as a coincidence, and that she's walking the streets like she always does. Maybe he'll buy it. Most people do. When she turns to see how close he is, she is surprised to see that he never exited the building. Chalking it up to good luck, Platinum hurries back to her car and decides to wait on them to exit the building. It's not long before they're back in the vehicle and driving again. This time back to the downtown area, not far from Tamale's office. As they get out of the car and walk to Ski Mask's truck, Platinum decides that the information they share may be pertinent to the information she is gathering for her sweet client. In order to hear what they're saying, she'll need to get close. Normally this would be easy, but she already has two strikes against her in the being spotted department, so she must proceed with caution. Ski Mask's truck isn't far from the entrance to a dive bar. She figures she can take cover in their entryway and still be close enough to overhear the conversation, and she's right, for the most part. Their conversation is brief and garbled, but she got the gist of it. Apparently Ski Mask was not aware of what the building was, and the man in the tuxedo was offering an explanation, but Ski Mask denied the need. Platinum's head turns from Ski Mask's truck when she hears a voice at her side. The man addressing her is very drunk, and has a baby face that makes him look like he's still in high school. Hey baby, how much to swim in your fish tank? Platinum smiles. I'm off the clock, sweetie. Maybe another time. <laughs> Bitchin'. The drunk man walks away, and Platinum turns her attention back to Ski Mask, but freezes when she sees that he is locking eyes with her through his side mirror. Strike three. Oh shit. She turns and runs through the bar. She notices a back exit and immediately heads for it. It exits into a long alley. If she tries running down it either way, he'll definitely spot her and race her down. She looks around frantically and notices a small nook leading to the establishment next door. It's tiny, but she squeezes herself into it the best she can. Within seconds, she can hear the back door to the dive bar open and someone step out. She knows it's him when she hears him let out a breath of disappointment. Her hopes are high that he'll give up and go back into the dive bar when she feels a strong hand wrap around her throat, heave her out into the alley, and then bang her up against the brick wall. Who are you? Platinum tries to speak but can't due to the pressure around her throat. Ski Mask notices this and loosens his grip just enough for her to speak. Platinum has been around long enough to know that it's obvious she is dealing with a murderer, and his wicked eyes tell her that he has no qualms about killing her. 
She knows that she may be dead, whether she explains who she really is or not, so she opts not to blow her cover just yet. She attempts to explain that she's nothing but a meaningless whore. It would normally get her out of a jam like this, but Ski Mask isn't buying it. The reason? She doesn't smell like a whore. Doesn't smell like a whore? Seriously? This guy knows his stuff. Who do you work for? The killer in front of her is intelligent. He knows she's been tracking him and she's not going to be able to get out of this. Perhaps spilling the beans on Claire will save her. Perhaps not, but it's the only card she has left and she's damn well going to play all of her cards before she dies. Fortunately, the intelligent killer is also impatient and provides an out for her. You work for them, don't you? Them? She's not sure what he's talking about and she doesn't care. She knows that if she plays this correctly, she may live to see tomorrow. By playing dumb, she's hoping he may elaborate. Them? And it works. The old man and the guy with the long face and wild hair. The description fits the men who hit him with the car and then carted him into the house. This is a total shot in the dark, but Platinum feels that she needs to take the initiative. She can't just answer yes and hope for the best. If he begins questioning her, she'll likely fall off the rails quickly. So she presents him with an option, hoping this may let her off the hook. You should talk to them. You might be interested in what they have to say. Ski Mask is studying her. She should find out whether she lives or dies within a few seconds. His evil stare is hard to read, but if she had to bet money on it, she'd bet on death. The dachshund barking causes Ski Mask to look down at him, breaking the cold stare from Platinum. With his hands still around her throat, Platinum can feel a shift in his energy. Within seconds, he lets her go and disappears inside the bar. Platinum stands, gasping for a moment, and then lets out a wail of a breath. She doubles over, thinking she is going to vomit, but the nausea clears quickly. She stands back up and rubs her throat. That was close, you lucky bitch. Chapter 4 Terminated Claire brings the knife down to her forearm and runs it across her flesh. She winces as blood rounds her arm and drips into the stainless steel sink in the kitchen. The slice stings, but it eases her stress. I should have never done it. Claire's curiosity had reached a crossroads. She was either going to be content with the situation and continue with the status quo, or make a bold move to satisfy her nosiness. She would have had no problem standing by her decision had this been a moral stand of refusing to carry on if her employer was committing atrocious acts. But that's not the case, and it never was. Over the years, her assumptions were that Ski Mask's life revolved around something abominable in nature, but Claire had told herself that as long as he wasn't abusive toward animals, she wasn't going to stick her nose in it. His genuine love for his animals over the years, a side of Ski Mask she came to realize most others had never seen, made her confident that any malice being doled out was certainly not involving the creatures for whom her life revolves, and that was enough for her. And it still is. Her need to know more stems from a selfish need. Her growing care for him has manifested into a need to be a larger part of his life, to be something important to him. And everything appears to be moving in that direction, but her impatience led her to this mistake. A tear rolls down her cheek at the thought of having possibly ruined everything. Another cut across her arm restrains her emotion. Keep it together. Does he know? If he knew, he would probably have said something, or worse. Claire lets out a groan and she puts another slice in her forearm. She turns her head when she hears whimpering behind her. All seven dogs are watching her. They are aware that she is in pain and seem concerned. Madeline is whining and tilting her head in confusion. 
Floppy and Dempsey both let out anxious yelps. It's okay. Claire wraps a dish towel around her arm, steps off the apple crate, and begins rubbing the dogs, who instantly relax. I'm all right. You don't have to worry, but thank you. Dempsey aggressively kisses Claire, knocking her backwards and causing her to giggle heartily as she pushes Dempsey away. Okay, okay, I love you too. Claire's happy moment instantly changes to concern as the perimeter alarm goes off. Ski Mask definitely shouldn't be back yet. Who can it be? Claire hurries to the main room and checks the monitors. She is exasperated to see Platinum getting out of her old car and looking around. Claire presses the intercom button. What are you doing here? Hello, sweet one. Wait right there. Claire pulls her shirt sleeve down over her freshly cut arm and storms out the door into the courtyard while huffing to herself. I can't believe this doggone nonsense. Claire makes her way through the underground passage, opens the bulkhead door, and emerges onto the road next to Platinum. Are you crazy? I think I'm a little crazy about you, yeah. What do you think you're doing here? You could have just messaged me and I would have met you in town. I thought this would be easier on you. I'm all about making life easier on you. Platinum grins seductively. How did you even find this place? I told you, following is my specialty. I tailed your boss here last night. Seemed like the kind of place that would have motion detectors galore, so I couldn't get close until he left. If Ski Mask comes back, we're both dead. I know, but I watched him leave. I'm confident that we have some time. Platinum strolls closer to the bulkhead doors that Claire emerged from. Where does this lead to? Claire puts herself in between the bulkhead door and Platinum. Her perturbed level is reaching its maximum. None of your business. You need to leave. Oh, don't you want to know what I found out? Claire stops and thinks for a brief time before answering. No. No? I'm sorry I hired you. I shouldn't have spied on him. This whole thing was a mistake. Claire takes some cash out of her pants pocket. How much do I owe you? Platinum moves closer to Claire. If you don't want the info, there's no charge. She leans her face in uncomfortably close to Claire's. I want my customers to be thoroughly satisfied, baby. Claire backs away from Platinum. Well, then good day, ma'am. Ma'am? Oh, you are the sweetest thing I've ever seen. The way you look, the way you talk, I can only imagine the way you taste. Ew! That was uncalled for and that is enough. Please leave. Platinum licks her lips and smiles. Your boss is a killer. What? I wouldn't feel right without letting you know that much. Claire doesn't respond. Her eyes dart around slightly as she takes in the information. Platinum studies Claire's face and comes to a realization. I just confirmed what you already suspected. Platinum's face takes on a concerned expression. Is he abusing you, darling? Of course not. Because if he is, I can help you. He is not harming me in any way. The only one who did any harm was me. I let my curiosity get the better of me and acted on it when I should have minded my own flipping business. I wonder if a good little girl like you would stick with this maniac if you knew more about him. I can find those things out if you'd like. No, no, no! You are not hired anymore. That, that, that's right. You are fired. Terminated. Effective immediately. Now for the last time, please leave these premises. Platinum pauses, looks Claire up and down, and grins as she gets into her car. After starting the engine and rolling down the window, Platinum sticks her head out and offers some parting words before motoring away. I hope to see you soon, my petite cutie pie. Claire just wants this all to go away. Her plan is to go back inside, settle in with a nice book, and do her best to forget. It won't be easy, but she'll try. She watches as Platinum drives off, hoping this will be the last she sees of her. But she has the sinking feeling that it won't be.
Chapter 5 Stalker Something drives everyone. That thought drums through Platinum's mind as she follows Ski Mask. Stalks him. What was it about that cute, diminutive girl? She was attractive, but not stunning. Platinum had sexual encounters with much more beautiful women than this one. Most people would describe Claire as plain, even though they would have to admit that her blue eyes are striking. Her minuscule size puts her in the adorable range of the scale, and her squeaky voice is fitting. But it's the way she exudes innocence that has driven Platinum over the edge. A purity so rare in this world that Platinum gets weak in the knees at the thought of corrupting it. Her competition for this delicate flower is formidable. Ski Mask Claire described him as an employer, but it's clear he's more than that. Platinum has been around the block more than once. She knows what Ski Mask is. A cold-blooded killer. Surely a sweet thing like Claire would object to being part of his life once she learns the truth. And where would she go from there? Certainly she would need someone to comfort her, and surely that person would be welcomed into her life. Platinum took a patient path, gathering evidence over time that would prove to Claire what a monster she is sharing her life with. And the evidence piled up quickly, culminating in the destruction of the deadly Medusa at Club Fun. But Claire was with him. Discovering them that night was unexpected. Platinum was there looking for someone new to allow inside of her. Someone unassuming and innocent, not unlike Claire. She thought she found her target, a nerdy man with black-rimmed glasses, a comb-over, and unkempt shirt. He was out of place, likely his first time in club fun. Platinum approached the man and could feel his hampered breath as she rubbed his chest. She moved toward the corridor to observe which room he entered. This would give her an idea as to what this meek man was seeking. And that's when she saw them, Ski Mask and Claire together. She followed them to the snake room. She waited and watched as Ski Mask carried Claire out of the room like a scene off of some damn romance novel cover. Claire is getting closer to him. They are becoming a larger part of each other's lives. The stakes have been raised. Chapter 6 Love at First Sight In the back of her mind, Claire always feared that Platinum would rear her head again, but that fear had dissipated considerably because she hadn't seen any evidence of Platinum since the day she terminated her. When Ski Mask mentioned to Franklin that he saw her in Club Fun, her fear returned. Claire knew there was a chance they may run into Platinum since she is known to frequent the place. Claire was reluctant to enter, but Ski Mask expected her to come with him. He didn't even ask, he just spoke as though it was a given. She couldn't pass up this opportunity. Refusal was not an option. Claire just hoped that if Platinum was there, she wouldn't see them. And until Ski Mask said otherwise, she had assumed that was the case. After Ski Mask had left for the day, Claire found herself looking out the window, wondering what the best way to correct the Platinum mistake would be. Sure, if Platinum continued to stay away, all would be fine, but the guilt had been weighing on Claire, and she had come to a decision. When Ski Mask returns home, she'll come clean and let the chips fall as they may. Hopefully he'll understand. Hopefully he'll forgive her. A sharp stress pain echoes through her abdomen, and she begins to make her way to the kitchen to cut her arm when the alarms go off. Claire rushes to the monitors, and her fears are confirmed. Platinum is standing confidently next to the bulkhead doors. Oh, shoot. The bulkhead doors swing open with force as Claire stomps out toward Platinum. What in the world are you doing here? Did you think I forgot about you? Platinum, it's time for you to go. I'll go when I'm good and ready. 
I saw your boyfriend carrying you out of the snake room. So heroic. He's not my boyfriend. Before Claire can continue, Platinum shoves a cell phone in front of her face and scrolls through the series of pictures she had gathered during her stalking. The pictures show Ski Mask in various stages of kidnapping or killing people. Your boyfriend is a psychopathic serial killer. He'll kill you too, Claire. It's only a matter of time. He would never. Not even if I told him that you hired me to follow him. Claire stands confidently. You're too late. I already told him everything. Platinum grins. You lie like a champ. Claire's body loosens. Well, I'm going to tell him. And when you do, he'll kill you. But it doesn't have to be that way, Claire. I can take you away from all of this. I can protect you. I'll be your mother, your companion, and your lover. We can be as one. Claire cringes as she comes to a realization. Oh my goodness. You are completely insane. Platinum scowls and loses her temper. I'll tell you who is insane. Your fucking lover. First of all, he's not my lover. Second of all, watch your language. And third of all, maybe he is insane, but we're all insane in some respect. Platinum, her mouth agape, is astonished as she finally realizes. You love him. That's none of your business. It is my business, because I love you. What? You don't even know me. Don't you believe in love at first sight? I loved you from the second I put my eyes on you. And you'll love me, too. Let me make this perfectly clear so there is no misunderstanding. I despise you. I will never love you. And when Ski Mask gets home, I'm going to tell him everything. If I were you, I'd go far away, because he may be mad at me, but he'll kill you. Platinum smirks. Not if I kill him first. Platinum slaps Claire, sending her to the ground, and quickly hops into her Buick and peels away. Claire picks herself up off the ground and rubs her cheek. Her rage at Platinum quickly transforms into fear for Ski Mask. Chapter 7 Crime Scene Tamale Jones jumps up from his desk when Claire bursts into the room in a panic. Do you know where Ski Mask is? Claire can see that Tamale is struggling to recall who she is. I was with Ski Mask, remember? Oh yeah, you're that little tootsie with the nice peepers. And you looked familiar to me. I could have sworn we had met before. We did! Claire moves swiftly to Tamale and grabs him by the tweed vest. You referred me to that psycho Platinum! I did? For what? I needed someone followed. Ah, well she is nifty at following folks, but she's a little nutty. She shakes Tamale and yells. You didn't tell me about the nutty part, you son of a bacon bit! Easy, easy, I'm sorry. I must have been in a rush. Where is Ski Mask? He went to the hellhole. It's that seedy place down by the river. Claire lets him go and rushes out of the office. Seedy was an understatement. The smell almost knocks her over. She stands out like a diamond against the scummy people frequenting the building. Some of the dregs begin walking toward her. She hurries inside, assuming their intentions are not wholesome. The smell inside is worse. Claire immediately holds her nose. Ew, that is gross. She can feel the eyes of the room spotlight on her. She clearly doesn't belong there. She can almost see the bubbles of thought above the occupants' heads as they dream of ways they can take advantage of her. She scans the room quickly and doesn't see Ski Mask, who would be easy to spot amongst the grubby clientele. She determines that it will be best for her to get out of here before any of the inhabitants can act on their impulses. Claire moves rapidly through the sea of people and rushes out the back exit. 
She looks to the right and sees nothing. As she looks to her left, a blinding flash of lightning makes her wince. A slap of thunder roars overhead as she witnesses Platinum rush at Ski Mask from behind, bringing her hand to the front of his throat and slicing. Claire tries to let out a scream, but nothing emits except for breath. From her view, she can see Ski Mask clutching at his throat and drop to his knees from weakness. Claire moves in closer until she is standing next to Platinum. As Ski Mask turns to view his assailant, his eyes lock with Claire's. Claire gasps at the fury in his eyes when he sees her. He thinks I was in on this! Before Claire can utter a word, the life remaining in Ski Mask's eyes clouds over and he falls forward. No! Claire turns to Platinum. What have you done? I just eliminated my competition. As Platinum turns and grins at Claire, she sees Claire's face begin to boil red with anger. Platinum doesn't drop her grin as she pulls a small blackjack out from under her skirt and hits Claire in the head with it, dropping her like a bag of sand. Chapter 8 Rage Lightning explodes overhead. Thunder rolls. Ski Mask awakens. In the death room, Ski Mask didn't even acknowledge his friend, the Light. He stood waiting to be catapulted back into the world so he can take his revenge on that bitch Platinum and Claire. It was Claire. As much as he'd like to think otherwise, it was her, standing next to Platinum, watching as he faded away. How long had they been plotting this? How long had she been a complete fraud? Did the woman he knew never exist? Was she nothing more than a facade? It doesn't matter. All that matters is that she dies at my hands, soon. As he jumps up from the ground, another flash of lightning brightens the area, and buckets of rain begin to pour down. He begins marching forward as druggies scatter from the woods like cockroaches as they attempt to find shelter. A permanent snarl affixes itself to Ski Mask's face, and his eyebrows furrow. Even through the sheets of rain, the riffraff of people can't miss the rage proceeding toward them and give him plenty of clearance with the exception of one disoriented man who stumbles into Ski Mask. Ski Mask growls and unleashes his fury on the hapless man. Ski Mask grabs him by the shirt and pounds him against the side of the building at least a dozen times before spinning him around and smashing his face into the wall. He finishes him off by quickly snapping his neck and tossing him to the ground. Ski Mask turns and sneers at the crowd like a hungry wolf standing over fresh prey. Wisely, they run, for everyone who slows him down will feel his wrath. Why? Recently the highlight of Ski Mask's day was coming home to see Claire. While at the hospital, he often found himself looking forward to sharing a seat with her in the parrot room relaxing with her, enjoying her company. Why? Ski Mask gnashes his teeth together as rain cascades down the windshield. The wipers can only clear it enough to create a blur, but that is all Ski Mask needs to make his way home. Why? He never trusted anyone enough to consider having them assist him in any way, until Claire. Why? He turns down off the main road to the long, quiet road. The muscles in his jaw begin to twitch from the constant contraction of his snarl. Why? She didn't judge him. She wasn't repulsed when she discovered who he was. She cared for him. He could genuinely feel it. And he cared for her. They were a team. And those eyes. Those lovely eyes. Why? Ski Mask turns onto his road. His breathing increases, forcing strands of saliva through his exposed teeth and pushing out growls with each exhale. How could she do this to me? To us? His heart pounds against his chest as he skids to a stop outside the bulkhead doors. 
He is a volcano about to erupt. The Reaper has arrived. Ski Mask gets out of his truck and notices that the bulkhead doors are open. He sees the old Buick parked outside that doesn't belong there. Ski Mask flies down the stairs and through the underground corridor. He doesn't slow as he reaches the courtyard and storms toward the door. He can make out Platinum and Claire standing in the main room through the bay window. Ski Mask's pace does not slow as he picks up a metal patio chair and hurls it through the window. Chapter 9 Eruption A clap of thunder erupts and Claire opens her eyes. The Buick's red dashboard detailed with faw wood grain is the first thing she notices. She turns to see Platinum struggling to see through the waterfall of rain rushing down the windshield, but glances quickly at Claire and shoots her a smile. Claire rises up and looks around as she gets her bearings and notices that Platinum is holding a 9mm compact pistol and pointing it in her direction. Where are we going? Platinum's smile grows as she clues Claire in. Home. Platinum pulls up next to the bulkhead doors and stops. Let's go. Claire reluctantly follows Platinum's orders and they both rush to the bulkhead doors. Claire quickly enters the code on the keypad and swings open the heavy door. Platinum urges Claire along by shoving the muzzle of the gun against the middle of her back. Claire moves as ordered and they quickly move through the underground corridor. The rain pelts their skin as they hurry to the main entrance. Claire enters, followed closely by Platinum who shuts the door behind them. The clicking of paws echo throughout the room as all seven dogs rush in to greet Claire and slow when they notice the stranger behind her. The greyhound Slick bares his fangs and growls. He races toward Platinum with the other six in support behind him. Platinum raises her gun toward the dog and pulls the trigger. Claire pushes her arm to the side, sending the bullet astray. Before Platinum can aim again, Claire shouts, Sit! All seven dogs come to a halt and sit. Stay. The dogs stay put and keep their eyes locked on Platinum. Some of them whine slightly, others suppress their growls. Claire steps in front of Platinum, blocking her from taking an easy shot at any of the dogs. Please don't shoot them. They'll stay there as long as I tell them to. I hate dogs. We'll have to get rid of them all eventually anyhow. May as well be now. Claire holds up her hands. No, please. Platinum holds her arms out momentarily, motioning to the room. This is all mine now. You're mine, too. And so are these mutts. And I say they die. As she begins to raise her pistol, she is distracted by footsteps running down the east wing corridor. Platinum turns her gun on Alfred as he rushes into the main room. Claire, is everything okay? He freezes when he sees the gun pointing at him. Who is this old fool? That's Alfred. Don't shoot him. It's getting crowded in here with mongrels and old men. It's time to make more room for us. No! Platinum puts her finger on the trigger and jumps when she hears the crash behind her. She quickly turns to see the metal chair bursting through the window with ski mask behind it. Shit! Platinum looks at Ski Mask with shock. I, 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 I killed you! She wildly fires at Ski Mask but misses badly as he marches forward. Her hands begin to shake with fear as she sees the rage in Ski Mask's eyes. They almost have a red glow about them. His face is wrinkled up into a wolf-like snarl as he bares his teeth like a wild animal. She tries to line up another shot and fires again, but her hands are shaking to the point where this bullet also misses the mark. Platinum has never fired a gun at someone bearing down on her like this. She's heard stories that even the most experienced gunmen can lose their accuracy in the pressure of a gunfight. The infamous gunfight at the OK Corral saw 30 shots fired in 30 seconds. Even with the participants occasionally no less than 6 feet away from each other, fewer than half of the shots hit their mark. 
In her panic state, Platinum opts to focus on a closer target. She needs to do something to slow Ski Mask long enough to gain her composure. Platinum grabs Claire by the hair, pulls her close, and puts the gun to her head. She can't miss from this range. Stop, or I'll blow her brains out! Ski Mask does not slow. Platinum whirls around, steps backward, and points the gun at Alfred. I'll shoot him! Stop! Ski Mask does not slow. Platinum pushes Claire to the ground and points her gun at Madeline's big St. Bernard head. Stop! Ski Mask stops in his tracks. He holds the expression of rage, but Platinum can see a hint of concern break through the fury in his eyes. Platinum takes several breaths, composes herself, and regains confidence in her aim. Still holding Madeline in her sights, Platinum flashes a spiteful grin at Ski Mask and pulls the trigger. The shot hits Madeline between the eyes. She falls in a heap without a whimper. Platinum continues to fire down the line. Slick, Dempsey, Floppy, Trip, and Snowman. They all take direct hits in the head or chest. Some let out one last cry before dropping over. Others fall without a sound. Max is the lone remaining dog. He looks to Ski Mask for help just as the shots hit him, pushing him backwards and twisting him to his side. Platinum turns the gun onto Ski Mask. His face is red. His spiked hair, silhouetted against the light, appear like flames. The white of his eyes have turned red, giving him a monstrous appearance. She would be most fearful if not for the gun she has aimed at him, and the knowledge that the trigger is about to be pulled. Adios, Ski Mask. As Platinum's finger touches the trigger, she is surprised to hear a growl. She turns her head to see the massive St. Bernard sitting up. Saliva drips from her formidable fangs as she stands and positions herself to leap. Platinum's jaw drops as Slick rises into standing position, snarling and enraged. In succession, Dempsey, Floppy, Trip, Snowman, and Max all open their eyes and stand. All begin to growl and fix their stares on Platinum, with the exception of Max, who stares at Ski Mask and yelps happily as his stick tail beats the floor. The shock of the sight distracts Platinum to the point where Ski Mask is able to launch himself forward and is on Platinum before she can react. He grabs the gun, rips it from her hand, and tosses it to the floor while grabbing Platinum by the throat and raising her up off the ground. While still holding her high in the air, he tosses her against the wall. The room fills with a symphony of barks as the pack of dogs seem to cheer Ski Mask on. Ski Mask races to Platinum, lifts her up, wraps his hands around both sides of her head, and places his thumbs over her eyes. Her blood-curdling scream can be heard over the dogs barking as Ski Mask shoves his thumbs in until he feels a pop deep within her skull. In one quick motion, he hurls her to the floor face first and flips open the knife from his belt. He is a blur as he positions his knee against the middle of her spine. He attempts to pull her head up, but her wig comes off in his hand, unveiling her stringy natural black hair. He tosses the platinum wig aside and pulls her head back, revealing her throat. In a frenzy, he brings the knife down into her throat again and again, cutting through flesh, tendons, and muscles. He pulls up on her hair as the barrage of stabbing continues. Platinum's screams turn into a slurp, like that of a straw sucking up the last bit of a milkshake. The remaining flesh strands of her neck break free from her shoulders, and Ski Mask flings her head across the room. Alfred watches on in shock. My god! A blood-spattered ski mask fixes his penetrating stare onto Claire and screams at her. You bitch! Claire holds up her hands as ski mask advances. No, no, it's not what you think! You lying, conniving tramp! Please, no! You whore! No, please, listen to me! Why should I believe anything you say? You're probably a filthy little slut, too! I am not a slut! I am a virgin! I've never even been kissed in my entire life. I'm as pure as it gets. You're a liar. You're a traitor. 
He grasps her by the throat and pins her against the fireplace. Claire tries to plead for her life, but his vice-like grip tightens so quickly she can't even get a breath out. Ski Mask, please, don't kill her! Ski Mask glares at Alfred before he can finish his sentence. Alfred quakes in fear and winces slightly, as Ski Mask's expression clearly conveyed a message. Shut up or die. Ski Mask continues to squeeze and can feel Claire's throat about to collapse in on her. She flails away at her throat with her hands and kicks her legs helplessly as her eyes roll back into her head and her skin begins to turn blue. All of the dogs have moved closer to the fracas and encircled the two. Their barks have turned defensive and choppy growling barks ensue. Ski Mask hears none of it as he watches Claire begin to die in his clutch. Madeline bares her teeth and gets closer to Ski Mask, pleading with him to stop. With the exception of Max, who cries sadly from afar, the entire pack of dogs move closer in aggressive fashion, but it's Madeline who makes the decisive move. The giant St. Bernard leaps through the air, snapping her jaws in objection as her body slams against Ski Mask. The force of the blow causes Ski Mask to drop Claire and crash to the floor. Claire immediately begins coughing and clasps her throat in pain as Madeline takes a protective posture between her and Ski Mask. Ski Mask, still enraged, begins to rise up, but pauses when he notices a pulsating stream of blood splashing against the wall. Confused, he paws at his throat and feels his blood gushing from the corroded artery that Madeline inadvertently severed with her fang. Madeline's eyes droop sadly, and she begins to whimper as Ski Mask eyes her curiously. Madeline! Ski Mask can say no more as his strength vanishes and he slumps backward onto the floor. The End The Nine Lives of Ski Mask continues with Life 8 Maniac.